Okay, so this is the week where protests continued in Iran over the murder of Masa Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish woman who was visiting Tehran and died in police custody after being arrested for not properly wearing a hijab, according to them. Um, protests have raged in 46 cities, um, very much so in Kurdistan. Um, Kurds make up 10% of the uh, Iranian population, and over 75 have been killed and 1,400 arrested. And when we say, like, I mean, a lot of the people who've been killed are young, other young women, right? Other young women who are, mm -hmm. you know, cutting their hair off in solidarity, wear, not wearing the hijab, walking up to police um, defiantly and being just open fired upon. I just want to play a little, little clip. It's not violent, but it is a uh, protest to give you a taste of what folks have been up to. So these are a lot of young people, a lot of women, um, women wearing hijab, not wearing hijab, burning them, not like just still wearing them, doesn't matter. But, it, but you know, and chants are ranging from justice for Masamini to down with dictatorship to straight up, this is about the Islamic Republic and the draconian laws, not just from the morality police, which is uh, the body that arrested Masa, but just in general. Um, and I wanted to just, Zara, your reactions, your thoughts, I don't know if you you have family in Iran still, but just kind of like off the top, what are you feeling? So much emotion. My whole family is in Iran. Salam. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We communicate on social media because I can never see them in person unless it's in a different country. Um, I'm not allowed and to why go. Is that? Uh -huh. uh, I w wrote and published um, work about sex and about coming out as queer. And that makes me uh, incapable of going. It just it makes it so risky. Uh, yeah. depending on where the country's politics are at, how they're deciding to rain down on activists. Um, folks before me, like Jason Rezaian, Shane Bauer, you know, um, showed me it's not really safe. There's a clamp down too that happens. Um, and you know, yo, for <laughs> all the folks out there questioning, should I have a pen name? Should I not get a pen name? Right. Uh, I didn't, I didn't realize until after my, uh, articles came out about me that went viral, um, that so many, uh, Iranians public facing Iranians use pen name last names so mm. that they're not Googleable when they go to customs because um, you have to protect your SEO so that you're not a, a known uh, entity when you go there and you can just go visit your grandma. Right. Um, and it's so have it's you been communicating been lately and like, what is it? How does it feel to see so many young women out there? on the streets. Yeah. I mean, it's such a mix of emotions, right? It's exciting. It's also really scary because I'm worried about them. They are dying. Um, they are dying at the hands of a government that does not care about human life, that doesn't care about their life, but also like just doesn't unilaterally doesn't care about human life. Right. Um, because yeah. they're murdering women over a piece of clothing, um, mm -hmm. that they're, that they're unilaterally deciding on behalf of everybody in Iran, that that means that they're not only um, anti-government, anti-Iranian, uh, but also and they're deciding for them that it's anti-Islamic. The, the the women have no choice in this, yes. um, and that's that's not Islam. These mm. these are the actions that they're committing are anti-Islamic. The actions that the Iranian government is committing right now are anti-Islamic, um, and statements like that. Um, that you just said, Francesca, that I didn't say, uh, make it hard <laughs> for people 
to boldly speak on other foreign country soil. You know, it, it makes it scary for me. I wonder, like, what do you mean my down with the dictatorship to... or just just like anything criticizing them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any amount of criticism. I mean, the, like and these are trademarks of fascistic governments. Right. Is that mm. like any any amount of like any kind of statement that you make, however, um, you know, small it seems. Um, and however part of a conversation it seems to be, have devastating consequences. Yeah. And I think it's so funny, you know, we're in this country, um, you know, first of all, the parallels between bodily autonomy and sovereignty, I think, need to be drawn. And any any woman in this country standing on a high horse and saying, well, at least we're not like that. No, in a lot of states, we're headed that way um, as our um, rights are. are being completely taken away and we're being left, yeah, to die. I mean, through sort of obstetric, you know, medical nightmares, but it's, it is a slippery slope, but at the same time, Again, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but I'm saying like, it's, uh, it's also funny that you have for the right is just like, you know, we don't have freedom of speech. You can't say anything anymore. And you're like, no, these are. This is a country where you can't say anything anymore. And in fact, countries that you cozy up to and love, you know, whether it's Hungary, right, or it's like Putin's actually not that bad. You know, he, you know, we saw also this week clampdowns on protesters in in Moscow and other cities across Russia. You know, around their escalation of war. But let's get into what's going on. So yes, even though. Masamini was Kurdish. It's bigger than that. So this is um, from The Guardian saying, um, there's no doubting the Kurdish revolutionary fervor that Masamini's death has sparked among Iran's long oppressed Kurdish population, said Ranj Aladdin, senior fellow at the Middle East Council on Global Affairs. But her brutal death has come to symbolize something much bigger than the Kurdish cause in Iran that strikes at the very heart of the political and ideological system that underpins the Islamic Republic. Um, and this yeah. is from... Yeah. And then this is just from a random woman, didn't want to be identified. She said, it's happening in ways that have ne we've never been, that have never been known before. Even if we don't win, we've already won in many ways. The state cannot ignore us now. Our stance has made them weaker. So, okay. Yeah. And thank you to, uh, the, another woman in Tehran who refused <laughs> to be identified that, that shit is fucked up. And please, news outlets that just like keep you know playing video of the protest pixelate people's faces mm -hmm. especially when people are gathering social media of other people you do, you don't know how that facial recognition software is being utilized totally yeah no that's so 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 scary and and i did want to mention you 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 touched on the hijab as you know like who determined this is the you know the end all be all of, of being a Muslim or being, you know, of, of Islamic faith. Or, I mean, actually that's, you said more about like the, the way the state's behaving, but I do think it's really interesting learning about the history of Iran and it's ties to how much and whether we, and what we ascribe the hijab, um, what kind of meaning we has ascribe to the hijab, because just quickly, and then I'll kick it to you, but we all must remember that the United States helped overthrow um, Mossadegh in the year 1951, is Iranian uh, president at the time, um, who wanted to nationalize the oil. And of course, the United States could have none of that. Um, we, no, we wanted our oil deals. We didn't want Iran to nationalize their oil. And he was kind of an, uh, a, like a middle, um, sorry, an Arab nationalist, right? Um, so not only um, sovereignty for Iran, but also um, pan-Arab solidarity with other countries. That also was a threat to the United States' um, economic and political interests. So they helped topple him, install the Shah. And under the Shah, um, the hijab was banned pretty much. It was seen as a symbol of backwards uh, ideology. No, you know, yes, we're Muslim, but no hijab. You know, we, we need to be so-called Western etc. Until 1979, when you have the Iranian Revolution, which then instills and installs and, and under which the current, you know, Iran is currently under 
the idea that, no, 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 the hijab is a symbol of Iranian nationalism, Muslim identity, religion, and it, ha and it must be worn. So here you have women being used as pawns back and forth, back and forth, based on whether they choose to wear a scarf or not. Um, and so it's a long history that is always centered other people making decisions for Iranian women and not women making decisions for themselves. And that, yeah. 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 So much, well, so much to unpack there. Let, uh, I, first I, I want to say, um, hijab is a concept, you know, um, not one piece of clothing. Um, mm. and in, in my, um, in, in my work, uh, and in my comedy, I've been sort of trying to, um, do what I can to m specifically state the headscarf as separate from hijab. Um, mm, okay. hijab, hi, hijab is a religious concept of modesty. Um, and that our notions of modesty and humility are faith-based. Um, and you know, my pops always said, uh, nobody gets between you and Allah. It's a personal decision, you know, how you interpret that and how you choose to express that. Um, these are my opinions. My opinions are facts on this. Uh, mm. and, and hijab, hijab is really different from like articles of clothing mandated by a government to I, the point yeah. that they will, yeah. to the point that they will kill you if you don't follow suit, uh, in that uniform is how I right. look at it. Um, right. and you know, so I really encourage people when we're talking about hijab to identify the difference between, um, what a government has decided to theocratically mandate as an expression of um first uh a approval of the government mm -hmm. approve you know a, um working you know uh in accordance with the mandates of the state uh and then god they have a, they have actively put themselves between uh the muslim people and god yes they've just de decided I mean, it's the same way in the United States, right? We, the, you know, Christian nationalists say this is how you should worship um, a right. Christian God even. I mean, shit, forget about other religions and, you know, the fact that we have religious freedom in this country. Um, but there is only one way. You know, you saw there was a video of a guy saying, uh, proposing um, a dad who was like, hey, let's put up in God we trust, but in uh, Arabic in this school. And they were like, nah, -uh, as if there aren't Christian Arabs, <laughs> you know, like as if, you know, there is only one way to worship their God. But but I think that's a really great point that like, and this is the thing is like, you are instilling um, meaning to someone's like personal faith and, and their own relationship with their God. Um, and I, and I having that, having the state personal. do that. Right. Having the state do that is really fucked up. So it's, I don't know. Yeah. And thank you for, for, for that, like drawing that difference. And I, and I think it's important to say that like in different times in Iranian history, wearing a headscarf has been seen as an act of resistance and protest versus not. Yeah. So again, when it was required, like now, if it's required, then wearing it a little bit looser might be seen and clearly was seen as an, like an act of defiance over which, an innocent woman was murdered uh, and women are, right. and people are continue to be murdered. Well, and, so and anyway, women yeah. can, women continue to be murdered, you know, um, as symbols of the state's power. We see that in yeah. the United States. We're seeing that across the world and we're witnessing that in Iran right now. And I think there's a reason why globally we're feeling that globally we're kind of over oppression. We're over it. Yeah. Yeah, we're just done. And I just want to, you know, quickly point out that um, it's not just me saying it, um, but in 2017, this is this is other moments in Iranian history where the headscarf has sort of been a symbol. Vida Movahed climbed on a f platform in Engel Lab Rev or Revolution Street in the center of Tehran, took off her headscarf and waved it in the air as a sign of opposition to compulsory hijab. She was followed by other women and the movement quickly became known as the Girls of Revolution Street. Um, and that women have been leading in also the tw 2009 Green Revolution, if you guys remember that, 
women have been at the forefront of a lot of resistance movements in Iran and calls for reform, calls for real democracy. Um, and then finally, um, you know, the most recent president, Ibrahim Raisi, when he became assumed office in 2020, the message was clear women would be further oppressed. Um, and women have been in the lead of all these protests, posing a real challenge to the regime. They're leaders of transformative change, the vanguard of potential revolution, challenge, challenging the legitimacy of the current government. That is from an article reposted on comment, I mean, on uh, informed comment. A um, man, Juan Cole, love him. But uh, any, any final thoughts, Zara? Oh, man. Uh, so many. Um, listen to the Iranian people. Listen to uh, what it is that they're asking for. Be wary of liberal racism and colonization that calls for, um, you know, uh, an upheaval and war. War is not the answer. Uh, and what the Iranian people are living through, um, they are the ones to speak to what is uh, right for them. Right. Absolutely. And I think that there, we can do both. Like we can report on this and talk about it without being heavy handed or like, you know, sort of, again, colonial about it and being like, well, I think this is what needs to happen. And so threading that needle is important. And, um, and yeah, critical. imagine that. Re right. Reporting where we're curious and we ask questions and we, <laughs> we let people about speak for themselves. <laughs> Oh, God, we don't want to immediately go to war. I mean, and this is the the last thing I'm going to say is, you know, this is at a time when the Iran deal is like on the fritz pretty much. I mean, Biden, you know, is supposed to be reviving it. But extremists in the United States and extremists in Iran, they hate, yes. I mean, on in the political right, they hate the Iran deal. And so and it seems like Raisi is part of the more, you know, the far right in Iran. And you've got the point is, is like, don't get it twisted. It's not us versus them. Yes. It's the far right in each of our countries versus the grassroots, the people. Uh, and so we need to make sure we humanize um, folks there just as we don't want to be defined by fucking Lauren Boebert or whomever. Yes. The, the sanctions that we place on Iran here are in part responsible for the strain on Iranians there. Yes. Yes. Also that, which is like, Come on. Like, I mean, I think that there's and again, this is like looking at Russia. You're like, where, what can Biden do? What more can he do? You know, um, Listen, and while Russia's busy, while, while Russia was busy, occupied, let's get some shit done. <laughs> right, because, yeah, Iran can't really lean on Russia too much. They're stretched thin. I mean, there are some folks that say uh, Russia has quite a hold on Iran. I don't know enough about the nuances of foreign policy to be able to comment on that, uh, except for per pure entertainment. What's going on, Frantifa? If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel right now. Hit that button. And also, you can become a patron and support the show every single week. Get access to bonus episodes and exclusive merchandise. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. Do it.